Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to The Take Up. Today we have episode 41, Embroidery on Prints, Color, Context, and Correction. Hello, everybody, and welcome to The Take Up. It is Friday, 2.30 p.m. here in the Mountain Time Zone, and I am in the Embrilliant Studios, which you can't see. <laughs> what you do see is a nice big uh, green screen picture of a lovely ZSK machine behind me, but I am in the Embrilliant Studios at my desk, uh, with lots of lights and fun stuff to make this thing look as good as I can for you guys. Unfortunately, it's still me on the cover. <laughs> However, I will try and give you some great embroidery information. And today we're talking about something that I actually enjoy talking about quite a lot. Uh, I don't fancy that I am an actual artist. I think I'm a, a fair interpreter and I do a little bit of art, but I do like to talk a little bit about uh, color and color in context and talking about things like prints. Now we're going to go simple and start out with embroidery over prints and discuss how to deal with that because it's something that comes up over and over again, especially if you're somebody who takes, say, customer supplied garments where you may not know exactly what you're getting, or say you have that lovely customer who likes to sneak in one strange tie dyed garment in and amongst everything else that you're doing. Well, we're going to talk a little bit about that. And then after we go through some of that, we're going to go just a hair into some color theory. I'll first talk a little bit about uh, color in general, matching colors, some things about disclaimers that you should put on your uh on your quotes and on your, uh, essentially on your mock-ups would be probably where you want that the most. And we'll discuss just the tiniest, barest part of color theory, because I don't want to go deep on that. There will not be time. And frankly, there are other people you can trust with that better than me. But I'm excited to get into this as something people have asked for, and I've written a couple articles about it, which we will cover. But first, let's go ahead and get to the comments. I can tell some of you guys are already in here today, and Yosta is in already. Hi, all. Hi from in Sweden. Happy to have you here. Thank you. Uh, Christine Shreve is in, a podcaster herself. You check out her Women in Business, Business podcast. And she says, good afternoon, Eric. Congrats on the Reggie nominations. Congrats to you, too. I saw your name as well there. And we're going to talk about that. If you're a Two Regular Guys uh, follower, if you listen to them, uh, we got some nominations, including the Take Up got some nominations. So all of you reciprocators out there, uh, thank you for tuning in and listening. And thank you for the nominations. We'll talk about that in just a second. Uh, Anthony Shedd is in here. Good morning, Anthony. Uh, Ramona McKee, hey, hello, and happy Friday. Happy Friday to you, Ramona. Hope things are going well in your end with the digitizing load you're working with. Uh, Justin Armenta, a digitizer as well. Hello from Arizona. Well, hello from New Mexico, Justin. Happy to have you in here. And Mike Muldowney over in, actually in Canada. So uh, <laughs> quite a ways different than where we are down south next to the border in uh, New Mexico where I'm at. Uh, happy to see you here. And Jeff Fuller, go check out MNerd if you haven't already. Hello, ready to learn? I hope I have something to teach you today, Jeff. You know a lot, man. <laughs> but yeah, happy to have you guys in. Richard James says hello. Uh, Maureen Smith Cunspin says uh, Southeast Pennsylvania in. Happy to have you in here. Uh, Dominique Labrec from Quebec. Thank you for tuning in. Tom Farr of Buzzards Bay Embroidery. Hi, everyone. Thank you for being here, Tom. He knows a great deal and does some consulting as well. Uh, if you haven't seen his stuff on attaching patches with embroidery machines, you probably should. Uh, Regina, uh, by the way, Regina Cassie, who I did a... Uh, a home visit, visited her business. She has a home-based business that she was running. And it was one of my first adventures out. So if you haven't seen the tune-up that I did for Printware back in the day, that was with Regina. Great to see you in Regina. Frank Dunn from Across the Pond, thank you for sharing the post. And thank you for being here in the evening. Good evening, Frank. And John Dynan, big Friday hello from Colorado. Hope you're doing well just north of here. And Curtis is in from Kansas. All right, folks. Oh, and Marta McCaffrey uh, right here. Marta from East Texas, thank you for being in with us. All right, so here we are. Let's get into this. Let's get into the colors. Let's get into how to handle, what are we talking about? Embroidery on prints. But like I said, we're going to start with embroidery on prints. Love embroidery on prints. Can talk about that. Then we're going to get to color context and correction, tell a little bit about that. But first, I promised I would talk briefly, briefly about the cool stuff that happened this morning on the two regular guys. And so I will bring that up. Let's go ahead and add this into the stream. Uh, first thing to show you guys, two regular guys, uh, it's a podcast that I am the producer of, and I'm gonna let you know that. But the thing is, everything is voted on. We have these awards have been going on for eight years now called the Reggies, and they're voted on entirely by industry people. Uh, it's something that's not controlled. The nominations are all industry, and the nominations came out today 
for uh, people we're voting for, for the Reggies. And uh, actually, Embrilliance has won before. We kind of stepped out a little bit this year. It didn't really campaign because we uh, we swept a lot of categories last year. We like to see more and more people being in the Reggies because it gets to uh, show people new businesses, new cool things happening. So kind of cool there. But it was very nice. A lot of people uh, brought me and some of our other reciprocators and friends into the fold for the nominations this morning. So if you didn't hear the two other guys, uh, we got in. So here's the two other guys. As you can see, Aaron Montgomery, the two other guys, did some a funny 2020 related artwork on this. But what you are going to see is the voting is open. I will dump this into, as you can see live, I'm gonna dump this into our comments so you guys can uh, actually take a look at it if you would like. But um, the thing to take away from this is that we, we are, I'm very proud that we were recognized and that people were really interested in what we're doing here. And like we said, there's best new product, there's things about customer service. That was one that Imbrilliance won last year, uh, among others. Uh, we also did some stuff for our new products and stuff, but yeah, and this is true. Christine comes in and says, uh, and Brilliance and Lisa Shaw killed the Reggies in 2019. Yeah, they absolutely did the best. And actually Lisa appears again this year as well. Despite the fact that we kind of stepped back a little bit this year, um, Lisa still comes up and I, I feel the same way. I didn't want to push really hard, especially as I'm the producer of the show. I don't want it to ever look like, you know, home team is in there, but even though I didn't really step up except for the last minute just to tell people, yes, we were about to close down on nominations. It was very nice to see people recognizing some the stuff we put together. So just going to scroll through this real quickly. And I'd say, if you want to check it out, the link is up there in the comments, both on YouTube and Facebook. If you want to vote for your favorite de uh, decorated garment industry stuff, go ahead and do it. There's great people on here and great products on here that you can vote for. But the cool things to see, uh, if you want to know, I got nominated along with great people like uh, Matt from the Rhinestone World, Marshall Atkinson, who you may know from Shirt Lab, Aaron Montgomery from Two Other Guys and from uh, our success group. Uh, Jimmy Lamb, who's out at the Hirsch, and Mark Coudre, who knows more than any of us know, uh, got nominated with them for Best Industry Educator. So there I am there. Um, you can check out Best Educational Online Content. And here's the one that's really proud for us and for also our friend Lisa Shaw, who's been on, you know, who's been in the comments here and who you guys know from her after hours. And I would love for you to vote for her, honestly. Uh, but I'm here too. I thought with the take up, we are here. The reciprocators are here. And I just like to say thank you guys for nominating. Super cool and glad to see that our community is making something happen with, you know, 41 episodes under our belt. It, you know, it, it seems to mean something. And I'm glad to see that. Other cool stuff, we have influential up-and-comers. So you're going to see people here from all, like I said, all over the embroidery and screen print and sublimation world. So really cool stuff. Uh, best guest on Tubular Guys. I actually ended up here too, which uh, is kind of funny because I'm the producer, but I've done a couple of episodes. So that was cool. Uh, we keep on going through here. Women in Garment Decorating Award, a really cool thing that we're doing this year new. Um, absolutely just calling out women who are doing great stuff in garment decorating. You can actually see here on that, Christine Shreve, who's in the comments now, uh, is nominated there as well. So that was really cool to see. And here's another one, most inspira uh, inspirational or encouraging decorators community member. And I ended up in there with uh, Todd Downing of OSG, Pilar Harrison, Matt from the Rhinestone World, Aaron Montgomery again. Awesome stuff. And this is actually the cool thing. When we first introduced uh, Best Ambassador for the Industry, I wasn't uh, fully producing yet. And I actually won that the first time that was introduced. And it's kind of like the big award. If there's like the, you know, the largest award for the Reggies, this is the one to say, hey, it's somebody who really has promoted the industry. And uh, I'm super honored to be put back up on that pedestal for a minute, even just to be nominated again, because I actually uh, won that first one. And that's one of my proudest awards. I've got a lot of awards from different things, from digitizing contests and magazines and all this stuff. But this was voted on by my peers and best ambassador for the industry is a really important one. And that was cool to see that too. So what I'd like to say is congratulations to everybody who's on here. And uh, if you want to vote for your favorites, go check out the Reggies. It's really cool. So uh, I put that up earlier, but I'll go ahead and throw it up on screen real quick right now. Um, two regular guys.com. This is the number two regular guys.com slash 2020 underscore Reggie's. If you want to check it out uh, and see what's there to vote. Like I said, Lisa Shaw has got her awesome after hours show vote for her. Uh, and Christine's on here for women in garment decorating, but I mean, get in there, find people who you like, find products that you like and vote for them if you choose to. So that's something I wanted to get through guys. It's, you know, it's not the main body of the show today, but I think it's something that is cool. And especially hearing that, you know, our little show, that all of you guys have really contributed to that you've been showing up for week after week is on that list. And I really uh, appreciate that. 
And actually, I love this here. Uh, <laughs> here's Brian Bailey chiming in about her brilliance here. Uh, everyone, please vote for Eric and Lisa. They won't ask, so we, we need to do it for them. We got tired of campaigns here at In Brilliance, but you can add to the wall of shame by adding a plaque or two. Thanks. Yeah, we made jokes about it here in, like I said, the brilliant, the brilliant In Brilliant Studios. Uh, we actually joke about the wall of shame, and it's that we actually all have a fair number of plaques and awards. I actually have a stack of them that I have not put up. Uh, since since we started moving our desks around, we've got some cool new desks and workstations that I may show you at some point. But uh, the wall of shame concept is for all of us with all these random awards and cool stuff that we've done to put up on the wall. We, yes, like a hall of fame, but we call it the wall of shame because for us, awards are never the, the uh, most important thing for us. I mean, for us, it's all about the community. It's all about the product. It's all about embroidery because we really do love this stuff. So for us, we call it the wall of shame because we think it's kind of funny that there's, these awards are there. But what I will say is it's very cool to be uh, in with a group of people and with peers who are making great content and helping people out. So and then I like this from Brian. This is how I feel about this. Uh, trouble is I can't pick. I want to vote for Christine too. Yeah, I know. That's It is so hard. Like I said, I, I have a hard time. But the thing is, even we get to vote at the two regular guys because it is all independent voting that is locked to social media accounts. So we get to have a vote too, but we don't get to influence the votes in any way. And so it's really cool. If you vote, you get your vote counted. I know we've all heard a little bit too much about vote, votes right now. I'm going to go ahead and move on to embroidery so we don't talk more about voting. What I will say is uh, thank you to those of you who've recognized both the show and what we do. And thank you to everybody who uh, is involved and who's, who's a reciprocator. All of you guys who are feeding back into this and playing with us in this space and learning, like I always say, and I'm gonna say it again, let's go full screen for this. <laughs> All of you who show up to these shows, who show up to learn, who engage and who communicate and who help each other, you are on top immediately. You are already in the top 5% of your industry, of your craft, because you want to help, because you want to learn. And I would like to congratulate you guys for being here and for doing that and for loving this craft that we do, this work that we do. All right, with that, let's get to the actual material here because I want to have the show. <laughs> let's do the show, guys. Come on, let's do the show. All right, so we're going to talk about the stuff we said we were going to talk about before. Let's get to it. Embroidery on prints. Um, this is something that comes up pretty frequently with novelty. And so I've actually got a couple different articles that I did for this. Now, the first thing I'm going to do is go ahead and give you the link to my blog post from the original article I did for Printware. And I'll go ahead and drop this in the comments. Once again, if you guys are in the comments, either live or in the replay, check the comments, you'll find a link directly to this. And this is essentially my summary of this because I'm sometimes when I write a full article, I will then do a short summary on my blog so that people can get through it really quickly. And it's kind of punchy and you get those bullet points. And if you're interested, you can go in deeper. So if you check this out on the blog, uh, it's called Navigating Novelty. And that's because the original piece I did for this, which I've expanded a couple times over the years, um, was really about novelty garments. And it was at a time where we were doing a lot of prints and where personally I was doing things like Hawaiian shirts and tie dye and it, what never has ended, what never has gone away with this is camouflage. So we'll talk about that in general, but this is what, what we originally started with. And what you're also going to find is I'm gonna go ahead and post one more link here. And this is the uh, online version that I did for Images Magazine in the UK, one of the updated versions, a little shorter, a little punchier. But if you really love, I know some people like the printed magazine version, uh, you'll find from that original blog post, a version from the printware uh, piece that has the kind of magazine format if you love that. If you love that, go for that. And it actually has a little bit more about camouflage in here because that's less of a UK thing. Thing. at least it was at the time when we were working with images. Um, and it is a little bit more of a thing that we deal with uh, here in my neck of the woods. There's quite a lot of uh, working on camouflage, but it is still pretty interesting stuff. And we, we're going to talk about different ways that we can address working on prints. Because the thing is, we all know we've done this where you get a print in and like this print here where you're like, okay, I've got multiple colors. I've got a lot of busy shapes. I've got a lot going on this print. How am I going to make something stand out? Now, this version of this logo that I designed uh, uh, absolutely stands out. We're going to talk about different versions. We're going to talk about what we can do. And I'll show you some versions of this thing because this is actually a test logo. Almost everything I show you guys is usually right off of a production line is from something that I actually created for production. However, every once in a while, I actually will make something. And this one is kind of fun because uh, Ginger Ninja, and this is not something he ended up using, is a friend of mine who uh, rehabilitated uh, and worked on making cases and stuff for uh, Japanese cooking knives, high-end Japanese chef's knives. And he's a very red-haired guy and he called himself the Ginger Ninja. And so I couldn't help myself but design this, this patch or this uh, logo type. 
So it's entirely my fault if it's weird. I actually drew and designed this piece. So if it's a little strange, uh, you can go ahead and blame me for it. But uh, this is essentially the piece that we were working from. And like I said, we've got some other stuff that we're going to go through, but I'll show you this really quickly. There's multiple different versions of it. And I did this very specifically because the idea here originally is to have this kind of piece that you're seeing on the bottom here where we're dealing with unsupported text and a small logo and we have to decide what are we going to do to deal with the fact that maybe on certain different colors on certain different backgrounds this is busy and it may not look very well and it might not set itself off very well you might get it lost in the shuffle and that's the thing that we have going on here and i'll go ahead and make that a little bigger so you can see it if we were on something like this this is a very loud print and if we use the original colorway the original colorway as intended the original couple of colorways that are intended, you can see that we're starting to lose a little bit of what we could see here. And we're getting uh, into a case where we've got a lot of contrast in the background. When you have a lot of light and dark colors in the background, uh, that extra contrast can cause issues with whatever's on top of it. Because it's hard to set yourself off from both a dark color and a light color at the same time without doing something to mitigate that or to work on it. So we're going to talk about the different kind of theories by which you could work on this. And I think we'll go ahead and zip back up here for a second. We don't need to actually have this all on screen. The examples will come as we get going. But let's just go ahead and talk a little bit about what we're going to do, right? So embroidery on prints is what we're looking to do. But there's a couple different ways we can handle embroidering over prints. And this is a pretty simple topic. So we might get through it fairly quickly and get on to color and this might be a shorter episode than usual. But the thing that's interesting about this is I think there are two main ways to handle this. And this is actually how you handle a lot of difficulty in embroidery. You either fight it or you flow with it, right? And I'm using that because fight versus flow is a nice uh, alliterative way to handle it. Both start with, uh, start with a nice sound. But the idea is either you fight it or you embrace it. You're either going to try and counteract the issue that you're having with it not showing up correctly, or you're going to embrace what's going on there and have it be part of what you work with, right? So let's start with fighting it. If we don't want to embrace it, if we can't bring something in or make too many alterations to the uh, logo type, to the background, to what we're working on, what are we going to do if we want to fight the print? We want to fight the print back. We want to make sure that the logo appears as it should appear well, there's a few different things that we can start to handle that, right? And the first and probably the most universally sought after one I see is to set it off. This is where we're adding an outline to the print. We're adding something to the logo where we're trying to outline and offset the initial piece. And here's something that I'll, and I'll go ahead and show you what we're talking about here. It's like this piece here. This piece for DKD, and this was done, we're showing this over a Paisley print. And of course, this is done digitally. And actually, it's in a software that has kind of a high shine on the, on the thread. So it looks a little fakey. Uh, it actually will stand off less than you're seeing here in that top yellow. There won't be that much shadow in a real print, honestly. Um, especially in this software, it has a very high shadow, high shine on the 3D preview. But the first option is to set it off. Now, what are the pros and cons of doing outlines like this? All right, if we have a big piece with satin stitches like this, even though this is a fairly simple piece and it does, but it does have a lot of ins and outs and curves and corners, this can be set off very easily with a nice thick satin stitch. As we know, especially if I were going to do something light for that background border, if there was a reason that I wanted it to be white or light colored, if I had to do something really thin, you might be tempted to use a straight stitch or a running stitch to do that offset. As we know in light colors, a straight stitch is going to show the shadows of the penetration points wherever the needle drops. It's going to have a shadow and it's going to look stitchy. I know we hate when customers say that. I know I used to, at least to drive me crazy. I'm like, yes, it's made of stitches. It's going to look a little stitchy, guys. However, when you use a thin outline made of straight stitches around something like this, number one, it's hard to hit the exact outline because we're going to have to deal with both pull and push compensation. We don't have a range of overlap to work with. Uh, we're definitely going to be very careful at the ends of satin stitches where we get up to this end and we have an outline out here. We're going to have to make sure we have a gap between the outline and the end because as push compensation or push distortion pushes that satin stitch out toward those open ends, we're going to have to make sure we have enough room so we hit that outline just right. So registration can be an issue with super fine outlines. And then, like I said, light colors on super fine outlines are going to make them look stitchy and broken and pebbled and not like a solid outline. So if we have enough room for at least a millimeter of reveal is where I usually leave it. One to 1.2 millimeters of reveal. And what I mean by that is of that 
border edge and I often do it underneath the logo and you can see on this particular piece that's exactly how it's done because I wanted a nice overlap and uh, that that border that you're seeing under that DKD actually extends the entire width of the border you see that reveal the entire width is also extending under the the uh, logo that's there so we have a nice overlap so it's a little fuzzy if things move a little bit we're not getting gaps we're not getting registration errors the thing is if we do that with a straight stitch around a satin or even around a field only whatever it is we're going to have to be very careful about our compensation very careful about our distortion and we're going to have to hit that outline just right and even then it's only going to work very well with dark colored outlines the next thing is we all know unsupported small text small details Anything that looks like red work or black work has engraving style lines that's unsupported, not on a filled palette. Those things are just not going to work with outlines. You can't outline that stuff. We're going to have to put something under them or do some other kind of work. And unsupported small text, um, you know, really, you're going to have to do something different entirely, probably. You're probably going to have to do something we're going to talk about later, which is backing it up, which is making another element that we add to the design. But for this case, for setting it off, for adding an outline, it really only works best when we have enough room to do a satin stitch. That way we can do multiple colorways if we have to. We can do light or dark outlines. And it works on larger items when they're unsupported. Now, if we have a big giant piece, like, like okay, if we're working on this and we're on dark material, you can see this has an offset outline. This has the backed up area and it has the offset outline. This thing will go on anything because it's essentially a patch. We'll talk about that again too later. This will go on anything this piece will go on any color in existence. Why? Because it can set off, it has contrast in multiple colors. There's no problem with this thing showing up. And because of the fully filled background we've added to the original element, this piece now coordinating with the original logo type, it doesn't, it's not exact, it looks like the original logo type, it's a version of the original logo type. This piece goes on anything. But we've made changes to the original art to make that happen. If the contention being that our original art was We'll scroll back down here, something like this, which is a much more normal logo style, or maybe something like this, it was clever. And like I said, on black, let's say we did that specifically on black garments because we're playing off of this original logo style. It's another version that we could use. Let's say we were trying to say, what are we gonna do if we put this on black and we don't wanna do an, a white outline or a light outline around the ninja's head? Well, we can do this only on black garments and have a cool variation. We'll talk about that in a second. But that's the thing, that's going with the flow. When we're trying to fight it and make it work out, we may not do well just doing an outline. People do an outline because they like to not change the art, but it doesn't always work on unsupported elements. Text like this is not gonna be ideal, especially that small text in ginger on a left chest size, the way this is laid out. Uh, outlining is probably not the best option. It's definitely not the best option for your production because it's more likely to cause failures and flaws. So that's what we can do, we set it off. What else can we do? We can make a move. Now, this is something that doesn't always work out, of course, but sometimes you're going to find that garments have patterns in one area that are annoying or somehow difficult to work with, and using an interesting placement may help with that. Now, this is not always the case, but uh, I've actually worked many times on color-blocked garments where they want to use a color block that matches some portion of the logo, and in this case, I've frequently offered if they don't wanna change a colorway, that we just do a different position or placement. What frequently happens is let's say we're working with uh, a, a company that has a red, cherry red logo that the entire thing is cherry red. Uh, I showed you guys Presbyterian Hospital, one company that I worked with before previously. They actually had multiple colorways and could work with this, but let's say you had something like that. Single color has a small icon on it, but it's all one color. And let's say the company says, we will not change that thread color for anything. We won't even make a reverse version of it. Okay. If they've got a red and black color blocked piece and they want it on that top, you're going to lose that red on red. And if they won't do a reverse version, most people will, if they won't do a reverse version or some sort of alternate color version for that, then we might choose to stitch under the color block, stitch on the hips, stitch on the yoke, stitch on a sleeve, somewhere else where it's not in the color that there is. Now, this is a simple question that you, of course, would have asked them earlier on. I'm not telling you anything that's revolutionary, work on a different place where it's not that bad color. Maybe not revolutionary, the thing is, it may not be something you think to offer right out of the gate. I would like to say, go ahead and offer that. The truth of the matter is they're probably not going to take it, but if you can show them then the idea of alternate variations, of color variations, something that I'm gonna discuss again in a moment, that's something you can kind of fight with and say, all right, well, we can't put it in the place you want it. I understand you want garments that fully match your brand colors, but if you don't have a secondary color for the logo, 
we're either going to have to change the garment color or we're going to have to do something with position placement or something else pretty frequently, especially if you show them some examples of corporate style guides that show color variations. And I'm gonna show you one of those in a second. The corporate style guide usually will convince them that a secondary logo color is something to do. A lot of us are working with small companies that have done their own design work or have had some friend or a friend of a friend or family friend make something for their company. Uh, frequently, that means that they haven't thought about things like alternate colorways, stuff like that. So move it somewhere else. If it's in a difficult place with a print, sometimes it will have another area. Uh, I know I had a range of shirts that had stripes in the body, but the cuffs were solid. And I actually had some corporate customers who really liked uh, cuff logos. So we did logos on the cuffs so that were solid cuffs and left the shell of the shirt alone. We didn't mess with it at all. So I think that was a cool way to handle it. Uh, one of the other things that we can certainly do is back it up, add a background. And that's something we talked about earlier and you saw in that initial piece. As we can see here, uh, if this was the original way these things turned out, and let's say that's the original logo types, the original variations and colors, and we don't really like how those turned out. Well, of course, what we can do is create a new version of the logo that has a background. Now, in this particular case, of course, we're dealing with this little ninja cartoon character that's here. It writes itself. If the customer is willing to go over something this large and we can fit the text inside of it, then a variation like this, that is a design variation though. And I actually think that this may not be really the way we're fighting for the logo. In general, the other option to do is do a patch style full color fill background. Um, I'm not usually a fan of these. And the reason I'm not a fan of these in general, uh, I wasn't a fan of these because most people didn't think they look integrated enough. But we have to remember that things have changed a lot. Back in the day when I was first embroidering, the idea of putting a patch on something was thought of as old school because it was seen as the earlier era of machine embroidery before we could do tubular hooping and everything had patches on it. They saw that as a lesser form, but now, the idea of embroidery that looks like a patch is a higher end form. And that's why I'm actually gonna say, I originally called this back it up in my original article where I was talking about adding that background shape, a fully filled shape that coordinates with the logo or maybe a contour around the entire logo. So let's say instead of doing this kind of shape, luckily this one lends to the design, but let's say that I did a rectangular shape that went around the entirety of this Ginger Ninja logo and just filled it. Uh, back in the day, that was seen as a way that doesn't look as much like direct embroidery and they didn't like it. And it was really an understated time. The thing is, if your customer isn't into super understated looks and they want it to stand out, you know, let's call it patch it up. Let's make it look like a patch. Why not? And Or let's consider actually applying a patch. These days, the uh, application of a patch to a garment is no longer a sign of, uh, you know, an old mechanics work shirt. It's not something like that. It is boutique wear. It is high end. People are putting patches on hats so much that I am regularly recommending post bed machines and manual sewing to people who would never have thought this stuff several years pre previous. So think about that now. We can do something patch-like or a patch piece. I also would love to recommend, again, applique. I love to do an applique piece that is very patch-like, but if the customer doesn't want to have the edge, that kind of edge that can catch on the edge of that patch, some people don't like that free-floating edge if they don't, the best thing is applique patch style, where we go ahead and applique a piece down. We stitch our logo through the whole thing if we want to. We can also stitch the logo previously on the patch and attach the patch with a full satin edge without pre-edging that patch. So we have a patch that's essentially like an applique with the design already on it. We do a placement line. We drop that design on that logo with a raw edge. And we go ahead and edge the entire thing with satin. So we now have a smooth edge that completely fits on the garment that is absolutely not going to give that floppy patch edge, but still has a patch look. And it's something that's becoming more and more common in very retail style as well. So another way to handle these prints like this, patch it up, back it up. So go ahead and put something behind it, put a full fill behind it, either a contour shape that follows the logo or a designed shape that looks, like I said, like a patch, because these days, patches are not something to be looked down on whatsoever. And also consider doing an actual patch. The other thing you might be able to do is outsource decoration to a patch or emblem company and add that to your printed piece. And I would say this piece that I've done here, though it was designed originally to be uh, direct applique or direct um, embroidery, I would look at this again now and say, this is probably a great reason to put a patch on. It's actually seen as a value add. And if I didn't do a patch, I would definitely be looking at patch style applique instead. So when we're talking about fighting the print, 
what are we going to say we're doing here, right? If we're fighting the print, we're doing what? We're setting it off. We're trying to get an outline on that thing. We're making sure that we're not having that print interfere with the logo, right? We're making a move. We're moving to another location somewhere on the garment that doesn't have that print or that has a less complicated color set, and that can help. Um, we're backing it up. We're putting something behind it that is supportive to the design that could, it could be a new design variant. That's something we'll talk about again in a second, but it could also just be a supportive area, something that looks very much like a patch or applique, or we patch it up. We can actually attach a patch to the garment. And the great thing is we talk about the difficulty people have using embroidery machines to attach patches to hats all the time. Well, that's on a cylindrical frame that has a lot more shifting to it. Uh, I would say that you have a lot less shifting, a lot less problem using your embroidery machine to attach patches to a flat garment. And actually, I've seen some really cool stuff. If you haven't seen ZSK stuff, now it's not something everybody's going to have by any means, but there are now things coming out like computer vision that will uh, find a patch and attach it for you. That's like the incredible, scary, high-end, crazy cool stuff but you can do it very easily like an applique with a placement line and a tack down stitch as simple as you please. So I think that's another way to do it. Handle it with a patch and go ahead and knock out that background out from around the edges. So that's one of the things we can do when we're fighting that stuff. Um, you know, I think that's interesting. And also this is true too. I like what Brian's saying here. And it's something that I'm going to talk about when we're talking about including the print, the shape could coordinate with the print on some pieces. And I've actually done some things like that. On, let's imagine this. Now, I'm going to go ahead and talk about this again in a second. But if we're looking at this Hawaiian print like this, let's say we're doing this Hawaiian variant. What if I took one of these hibiscus flowers, made a shape that looked like the outside of the hibiscus flower, and I dropped the logo inside of that shape. The shape is a solid color. We're now including the print into our work, but we're still offsetting it so that we can see the logo. We're making the logo less complicated. We're increasing the contrast. We're being able to see the logo and all the details therein. Well, here's the thing. We can also go with the flow. We can go with the flow on the print. And there's multiple ways we can handle that, certainly. And I'm going to talk about some of them. I mean, I think, honestly, there's something to going with the flow with, with this. Now we we're, we're using the patch here, and that's fine. But the thing is, we're not fighting to keep the integrity of the logo exactly how it is to some degree. We're going with the flow in the fact that we are creating a variant version. Right, variant versions in this case is creating a logo that's specific to the printed garment to that style. Now there's multiple ways we could handle that, right? One of the ways we can handle that is certainly to do something like this where we're changing shape, we're changing the design, we're adding an element. And that's one way to handle a variant version. And it requires some design work and it may be something that some people are not comfortable with. Like I said, what, what we can be more comfortable with, and I'm gonna show you this uh, real quickly if I can, um, there's a possibility that we can talk about, you know, style guides. And I'll go ahead and blow this up a little bit. When you look at a corporate style guide or something like this, this is from uh, my alma mater, the University of New Mexico. Fairly frequently in corporate style guides, they'll actually show you what do they want to do on different colors. And you can see up toward the top here that we actually have uh, the logo, which is often in cherry red here, on a cherry red background. And what they often do with that is make it a single color. So this multicolor logo becomes a single color. The background behind what we call the doghouse is actually at the top of a building. It's a architectural detail from a famous building on the campus, the library. Um, we will take that quote unquote doghouse and we make that a darker color. We make that into either a cutout or the red that is of the garment. And then the rest of this little circle, this little kind of sunburst that's around it, we will then actually will make that into white. Now you can't see it on this particular piece, but that's how it's handled. You can also see how they handle not only multiple different colors. You can see on a light color how we have this dark gray. So we have a contrasting letter form. These unsupported letter forms are now given a color that makes sense. Uh, we can also see what they want to do on dark colors and how they handle being on a photographic background. And what I'll say is when things are on that photographic background, that's the most like what you're going to do with a lot of prints. The thing is photographic background doesn't have this incredibly high contrast. But what you can see with this is that some of these corporate guides are not going to allow you to go with this kind of knockout style, or at the very least, you're going to have to contact people. And if you're dealing with somebody who's you know directly from that company, directly from that place, then you may be able to get away with something that is this kind of variant version, this patch style. And what I will say is where they won't often do this in print, where they allow for a colored background or a raft behind it, you will find that when you're dealing with a patch with an object that's applied, you may get away with a lot more because it's considered to be different than 
say a print where we're using a big block of color behind something on a photograph. They do show you what they would like to do with direct decoration, but it is possible to do something different. And I would show people something like this. If you can find an example of a style guide like this, it's great to show your customers to say, hey, big companies are doing this. And if you look at things that are out there from big companies, if you look at the Nike logo, what I always say is this, right? Uh, we're talking about coordination, not replication. If you look at Nike, Nike's logo is not always in the same color. It's not always in the same shape. Sometimes the swoosh is separated from the letters, but it is intentional. Now, do they do different treatments to that logo? Absolutely. You will see you know, a neon green outline of that swoosh at, or you'll see a solid raft of white in the swoosh. These things are different. These colors are different and it's, it's iconic and recognizable. So they can get away with a lot of that, but showing a customer that will let them know, Hey, even though we're on a print here, I know you like your color. It's not working on this color. If the print is the most important thing to you, then maybe we want to work on, like I said, a variant version, go with the flow, make something specific to the print. If the printed garment, the, the, apparel that is this novelty color or tie dye or print is so important that you want it, then it makes sense to say, okay, we're making an allowance with the logo or doing something with it that makes it make sense. And the thing that Brian brought up is including the print. The other thing we can do is definitely include the print as part of the process. Now, including the print means that we can do things like make a alternate shape, a raft that is in the shape from something from the print. We can add that in or we can do things like let the print become part of the logo itself. And though this is not from that particular piece, uh, and actually I'm, <laughs> I'm showing you guys the wrong stuff, as I sometimes do. Um, this is the one I wanted to show you guys. We've talked about this many a time. Um, I've, I've done pieces where we have a full color sublimated transfer inside of print, but this still il illustrates the same kind of thing you could do. If your logo is such that it has something like a void in it, you could actually use an outlined version of the logo and allow the print to show through. You could include the print as part of the design work, but all of these things mean you're going to do a little design work. Not everybody's comfortable with that but you can include the print as part of the design. And like I said, most of the time when you're dealing with novelties or prints like this, it may be that that print is important to the company for a reason, or there's an event, or there's something else that makes that print part of their identity, part of their purpose, part of their branding. If it is, it makes sense that we make some sort of variant version. And when we do, we include the print. We're not just trying to replicate the same logo on everything. We happen to put it on the print. It's better to do it with intention when we can. Now, certainly when we can't, we do the things we talked about earlier. We fight the print. We put a background on it. We throw a patch behind it. We put an outline on it. That's what we do when we have one garment that's got a weird pattern that isn't with the rest. And it just happens to be because one person has been allowed to select a garment that has a strange pattern. That is one thing. If we're designing for an actual garment, an outfit that has to include the print, that the print is important to, if it is their Hawaiian event and they're all using Hawaiian shirts, whatever that is, then we want to think about making variant versions that make sense, making alternate colorways that make sense, or doing things like this, including the print, because then the holistic view of this thing is that we have made a design and we've made not just the design work on a garment, we've made a piece. We've made a uniform piece and apparel piece that includes design, that includes the print, that includes the selection of the garment and takes that all into account to make one coordinated item. And the other thing we can do, and this is the thing, when we're selling things, I always try and tell people about coordination. And usually it's about prints and hats, or it's about uh, hats and flats is what I usually call it, where somebody's got outerwear or some logo that does not work in the location where they want to use it, right? There's frequently people who will use a logo that has... Uh, that is larger, has a lot of text, has something where it's not gonna work on a hat and they've got it somewhere else on their garment. They got a full jacket back, they want on a hat. They have something large on the left chest, they now want on a hat and it doesn't really fit. Or they have hats like my hat, a military style hat, a uh, flat cap like this only has like an inch and a quarter worth of vertical space on the front of it and you cannot put a lot in it. Well, that's when we wanna think about accessorizing. And usually the, the, the phrase that I like to throw out there is coordinate, don't replicate. And what that means is instead of including the entirety of the logo, let's say we're talking about that Ginger Ninja logo again. Let's go ahead and throw back to that. We're looking at this Ginger Ninja logo. Can you imagine then, let's say I go ahead and put the text in a raft or something else on the left chest of the garment. Okay, fine. Maybe it doesn't work on the garment. Let's say I make this a uniform instead and say that this garment doesn't get decorated with that. Maybe I just put the ninja head that is offset pretty well on the 
on the garment itself. I can put that on there. It offsets. It has a fully filled element. I throw an outline on it and nothing gets hurt. And then the text goes on a solid, solid colored hat that is accessorized with the shirt. So if this is a uniform piece, this becomes a set. And that set has text here, logo here, text here, logo on sleeve, something that sets these things apart. Now it's great for other reasons. Like I said, if you have problems with trying to get everything in the available space, that can be one of the reasons we can handle that that way. But accessorizing can then give you a clean slate to work with that isn't the same as the print. And I think that's a great idea. Now, honestly, I consider the patch thing to be almost in the realm of that accessorizing. It certainly works that way to some degree, but there's certainly a reason, especially when we're working with uniforms or business to business, or if we're working with any sort of team or club, I think honestly, it goes into more retail spaces just fine too. And I like it in a personal space, but especially when we're talking about businesses and teams and uniforming, makes perfect sense to say, okay, you've got a coffee shop, you want to use a wacky print here, or you want people to have different kinds of things for their shirt. Great. Let's make really cool understated aprons that go with just about anything and then have your logo on the front. And we don't mess with doing stuff on the, on the actual garment, or we drop a simple sleeve logo that's associated with your logo, but doesn't have all the text and stuff that gets caught up in all of this contrast trouble. So we can do accessorizing. So think about that. We add an accessory instead of trying to fight back the print. Now, certainly there's other ways we can handle it. Um, and uh, I think that there's, there's simpler ways we can deal with it, certainly. And when we're looking at like this piece here, the other things we can do is just go with the flow entirely. And some of that is to say, let's go ahead and allow things to be understated in a colorway. Now, at this point, I'm showing you the old logo from the company I was with, Black Duck. And these are some options you could take with colorways and say, all right, well, we could handle it with colorways and say, these are the colors that are present in the print. And we can actually show these in a preview ahead of time and say, we want to be understated. Now, personally, this isn't going to work for a lot of clients, but if they want something understated and the print is important to them or the, or the garment is important to them and they just want an understated piece that identifies their logo but isn't very visually uh, contrasty, there's something you could do here. We could say, all right, let's show a customer a couple of colors that are selected from the piece. The gold and the light blue here are selected from the piece. Once again, uh, this software puts a really high shadow and shine on things, so it's probably not the best version that it could be for that. And that's something we're going to talk about briefly in a second, or we can show them a full black, full white. Now I'm going to say these, I don't love doing that on something like this, where the print stands out and is important to the customer. I would really recommend that they're outlining anything else they do is somehow taken from the color palette in the print. Uh, if I were doing this, I would be much more likely to say, even if I wanted more contrast that I don't maybe want this fully, incredibly bright, brilliant white. I might not want that full black when there's nothing that dark, that black in the print. We might go with something else if the customer will allow for it, especially when we're talking about single color treatments like this. This is the kind of stuff that you saw in that uh, corporate style guide where frequently there's a little bit of leeway, especially if the logo itself, if the company has a logo that is iconic by its shape. If you could identify it in one color, black and white, then that's the kind of logo that works really well with using a colorway to handle that instead. And that's something that we can think about. But once again, you're gonna find that a lot of people are gonna go with this. I think most of the time, corporate clients are gonna to wanna to fight the print a little bit. And these days with patches being so popular, I think a lot of things are going to end up with backed up areas or the patch style. Uh, and honestly, it takes a lot of the trouble out of working with prints. At the same time, I think that this is a totally viable option for understated work. If you've ever done tone on tone work, I think you can do things in that in that kind of style where we pull a color out of the garment and allow it to fade in and gave that to the customer as an option. You never know. Some customers really do like the idea of an understated print. And in that case, understated stitch out on this would be to let it fade in, let it be part of the color palette. And especially if we're working, we can impal this up with the idea of uh, adding an accessory. You can have an accessory with a whole lot of contrast and then have a version like this where we use a color from the garment and we pull back into the print a little bit. And it's almost like an Easter egg, something for someone to find if they know what the logo looks like. So I think that's interesting in and of itself. Uh, so it could be something like that. And let's go ahead and grab a couple of uh, comments here. Uh, Cindy King says, uh, sorry to be late, hello. Happy to have you in Cindy. She said, I just did some Western shirts like that. It was hard to decide the color to use. You know, it really can be. Uh, one of the ways to handle that certainly is to grab a color palette. There are actually some online tools. I don't have one queued up right now where you can grab an image of your 
piece and throw that in there and it'll give you a color palette that's generated from that garment and then darken or lighten the color out of that color palette that's in the garments print and work with that. It's something you can start with if you're trying to be less like more understated like this. Otherwise you're really looking for contrast or you're basing it on the logo and it really depends. Uh, we have another comment from uh, Lynn Smith Kratz here. I ran into that very issue with a customer that wanted their full logo on a mask, just wasn't gonna work. Abbreviated adjusted logo to fit on the mask and they love it, winner. Absolutely. The thing to tell people and here's, you know, I'm gonna go ahead and kind of go full screen on this so I can talk to you about it. The thing to remember with this is that you have to talk to the customer about what they need and what their intentions are. And if you've been in any of my other take-up episodes where I talk about dealing with issues or uh, mitigating customer expectations, and that's something I might do another full episode on at some point here, uh, you know that one of the best ways you can handle this is to communicate directly with the customer and find out what's important to them. You may find uh, as I often do, let's say we're looking at that Ginger Ninja logo. You may find that for them, the most important thing is the Ninja head. It's not the text. And so the text falling away is not a problem for them. And they find that they would rather you have a larger rendition of that element because that's more important to their branding for them than the name. They feel like the name will carry off or maybe they uh, are using this behind a countertop that always has their name on it. And they don't feel like their people who are always behind that counter uh, would need to have that name there. They just want to have an associated object, a gimmick, you know, they have that patch, that logo that attaches their garment, their uniforming to their location. Or let's just say that we're dealing with this, you know, it, maybe we're talking about something that's on an online forum. We're doing something like this, where they're doing work via video or calls. Maybe having something on a hat is way more important than having it on a sleeve or somewhere else because no one's ever going to see it. And they're going to be like I am right now and be a talking head. If you're doing a lot of Zoom uh, meetings, but you want to have some sort of corporate branding on you, a hat's not the worst idea idea. Uh, the thing is, that means you might have to do some different coordination. The thing to ask them is the same thing we talked about uh, in the previous episode recently, where I talked about durable embroidery. It's the same thing we've talked about with, uh, you know, honestly, several topics. It's asking the customer, how will the garment be used? Where will it be seen? What's the most important part of your logo or branding that you want someone to see, read, or interact with? And have that be part of the conversation because you may find out that the customer is going to offer options for you or that when you give them options and say, hey, you know, if it were my logo, and it's a phrase that I've used a million times and I, I encourage you to use this. If it were my logo, this is what I would do if I wanted someone to see that new brand that we made up, the new icon. If it were my logo and I was going to be at a food truck, I wouldn't put the logo on a uh, apron below my waist because no one's ever going to see me except for above the waist because I'm at a counter. If it were my logo and I was going to be on Zoom calls all day, I might put it up high on the left chest or on a hat because I want everybody to see the logo and I can't have it anywhere else if they're only going to be talking heads. These are things that work in context. These are things that you have to deal with in the way they're being used. And honestly, it works with everything, including, like I said, the when we talked about the embroidery for durability, and I said, you know, big satin stitches are not gonna work if you're working in construction or landscaping, you're gonna snag them all the time. If it were my logo, I would use a different fill type. I know it doesn't look as shiny as you want it to look, but it's less likely to snag and you're not gonna lose garments. Uh, using context is a big thing and context here is a big thing as well. And with that, I want to get a little bit into color context as well. We're gonna talk about that. Uh, certainly, like I said, I would like to show you some more stuff. We'll, we'll go ahead and go over one more time a little bit of the stuff that we we worked on here. Like I said, we can set things off if we're fighting the print. We can create a background or a patch and that helps us to knock the print back and it gives us something to work from. In this case, it's coordinated to the logo type and it makes sense for that design. And it's larger, but it includes the text. It's something that is not exactly the original logo, but is close. We can work with colorways on different colors and we can even incorporate the way that the color or the print or whatever it is works with the logo so it coordinates well. We can certainly do that. We can use different colorways, we, but when we're dealing with something like this, we can either fight or we can actually vibe flow with it, you know? And here's one of the other things we have to make decisions about, right? Talk about camouflage. And this is something that I've dealt with many a time. Camouflage, uh, it really is kind of a bugbear. It's something that's a little bit uh, difficult. It's something that 
you don't always have a good line on because camouflage understandably is something that's kind of not meant to be seen, but it's now used as a fashion accessory. So sometimes it is meant to be seen. The thing is camouflage often has a fair amount of contrast. It has some contrasting element and it's hard to see. This particular piece is one I did many years ago for Vias Caldera. They had a hunt team out there. And this is one of the, uh, the you know, bugling elks <laughs> or that I always talk about, the elk heads, the animal heads that made me uh, actually use some stock designs. This one is one of mine, but it is something that made me want to use stock designs more often doing all these things. The thing is, when we're dealing with, with uh, camouflage, this is another time when we're talking about fighting or blending in. And here are the kind of two ways we can handle it. Already, we're using some we're essentially using some, you know, colors that are going to blend into some degree. The animal colors are going to blend in with the camouflage somewhat. Why the animal's meant to blend into the forest around it? Because it certainly doesn't want to be seen, especially not by the Vice Caldera hunt team. Uh, the thing is, when we're talking about a garment, we have to say to the customer, what's important? What is it that you want to be seen? Is it important to the person who's wearing it because they know what it is and it's a souvenir? Or do you actually want somebody to be able to read it? Uh, if we look at the text here, there's two kind of theories that were going on once again. On the top, we're talking about kind of fighting the print. In this case, because camouflage tends to be in one kind of tonal range, we've got all greens and browns here. I used a gold, which is not too far off from that range, but this light old gold pairs really well with it, but it does offset it. It does certainly not look like the rest. You can see it despite the fact that uh, the elk does, with the outlines is not exactly super, super visible. You can tell what it is and you can definitely read the text. The other option here is further down. If it's for the customer, if it's for the person wearing it and this is a souvenir for themselves and what's important to them is their identification with it, not that someone else reads it, you may say, I want to accessorize it and make it look like the camouflage and we're going to go ahead and use a color that is not exactly any of the colors in the camouflage but blends in with it and this kind of olive green does blend in with it but it is not exactly any of the tones that's there and these are two ways we can handle it and really it's about talking to the customer about their expectations and what i would say uh certainly what do they go with they went with the gold what it turns out is despite the fact this is camouflage and yes camouflage does its job this real tree camouflage does its job um certainly they use this one Camouflage still does its job and a tiny little logo on the hat's probably not going to spook a buck from a distance. Uh, but what it does do is still allow the text to be visible when they are wearing this outside of the hunt. And frankly, yes, we can talk about the functionality of camouflage for the hunt. The truth of the matter is we're wearing this in town after and before the hunt to identify ourselves as part of the hunt team. So people know who we are and what we do and what we're working for and what we're into. Because part of what embroidery really is, especially in this kind of case, is to say, this is my affiliation. This is what I'm into. This is what I like. And that's what they chose to do. And frankly, I think this is the right choice for a lot of people. Um, but you will see, I didn't go with something crazy. Now, sometimes you will see that people will honestly do something. I think it's kind of funny. You'll have a super high vis thread on camo. Totally an option you can do. High vis thread on camo does mean that you're visible and you can see things moving a little bit. Maybe if somebody's looking for you, they might see the top of your head. Uh, certainly depends on what you're doing with your hunt stuff. I would say most of the things that I made in camouflage, honestly, honestly, but a lot of the stuff that I used for camouflage for was never meant to actually be worn in use. It was something that was meant to be worn any other time to identify yourself as someone who uh, is into outdoors uh, into the outdoors, into hunting, into fishing, into whatever that kind of uh, lifestyle there was. So Brian, who asked, which one did the hunters use? The hunters used this one. They used the gold text. And I actually think that this is the best branding choice as far as uh, I'm concerned. But I'll go ahead and go with a couple more comments because I think some of these are funny here and, and usable. Uh, Justin Armenta Digitizer as well says, if it were my logo, I would not try to do one line of text with 25 words at three inches wide. And I've said this a million times. And th though you're making a joke about the fact that you'll try and do this teeny tiny text, um, the thing is, this is how I would really phrase that. I'd say, if it were important to me for someone to read these 25 words, I'd make them large enough to be for them to be read from a distance someone would be seeing them. If it were important for me, that someone can read these words, then they're probably not going to be on a hat or they're going to be somewhere really large on a hat. And we're gonna to have to remove parts of the logo that you have in there because in all honesty, it needs to be big enough to be read from three and now six feet if it's going to be usable for anyone. <laughs> so yeah, if it were my logo, I wouldn't do that one line of text. I would also say, if my aim 
if what I want is for someone to read that line of text, I wouldn't do it that small. <laughs> I'd make it legible. All right. So we'll also go, uh, Mike says, uh, we'll go with his cam comment as well. Camo hats are the worst. Sometimes the stitch holes are more visible than the stitching. Now, here's something I want to address. And it's specifically about things like this Realtree hat here. And it's something that I actually put in the notes because it's something that comes up so frequently at camouflage. One of the reasons why they look terrible, it's something that happens on, on sublimated prints. And you may notice something similar on chambray. If you know, I'm not talking about denim, I'm talking about chambray. Kind of different materials, close. And we're going to talk about this briefly, but here's the thing. Uh, sublimated prints is one of the ones that really cause the problems. And I'm going to see if I can pull this up. If I can pull the image up that I'm looking for here, I will show you guys what I'm, what I'm doing and we'll have a, have a look at it. Hopefully I can. Uh, essentially, I'm going to show you it briefly, just this little piece of a sublimated patch. Uh, had a little issue earlier pulling this up, but let me see if I can get it pulled up for you. All right. So yeah, we've got it. Here's a sublimated patch I've done, and this is not showing it very much. It's much worse, especially on dark sublimated prints. You'll see a white edge around a lot of the text or penetration points look white, look weird, look chewed up. And people will frequently say, am I getting bobbin pulling up? Is there a problem with my stabilizers or something coming up? And here's the thing. It's none of those things. I'll actually show you what I'm talking about here. You can't see a lot of it, but in person, it's a little more visible. I'm going to zoom way in on this high definition kind of version. And you're going to see all along this edge, we have these little white specks. All along this text, there's little white specks. It looks kind of rough. There's a speck in here. Over in here, there's specks. This edge looks ghosted. And what I've actually had people ask me also, if they're into sublimation, they're like, oh, well, did you print it after the fact? No, this material was pre-printed. The problem is sublimation, though it does get into the fibers, it's the top layer of fibers. And when we start poking thread through it and pulling on these fibers in the fabric, we can reveal the white fabric underneath the sublimated layer. So one of the problems you're going to have if you're working on sublimated camouflage hats that have this ghosting effect on them, nothing you do to your digitized file, nothing you do to the way you're embroidering is going to fix that. You're not going to be able to fix that look. That white edge that's on stuff is not going to work out. You can't fix that on sublimation. What you're going to have to do is put something on top of it or apply it in some other way if you want that to happen. The pulling causes the little white edges to show. And that's the other thing I wanted to talk about, chambray. If you've ever seen chambray material, it looks like a denim, but it has a, a like an indigo facing on it. The threads that are in the front of the weave have indigo on them, like jeans, you know, but it's not exactly denim. Chambray is a little different. When you sew on it, it pulls those th top threads, the front facing threads apart, and below it is a white, I believe it's the weft or the warp, I forget warp or weft, uh, what that is exactly, I think it's the warp threads. You will see that that fabric behind it, or because it's woven in such a way that we have that facing is the indigo and the back is white, you'll see the white threads from the weave all around the edges and people will mistakenly think that it's bobbin thread. Invariably, they say it's bobbin thread, it's something coming up, it's something attached to the thread, something looks wrong. That's why we're getting this ghosting. Absolutely not. You're seeing the weave of the material. And also, that's the same thing. Ramona says printed fabric too. Absolutely. If you have printed material, if there's something that has a surface print on it of some kind, and you put embroidery over it, especially a row of satin stitches, they're all lined up nicely. A uh, text is a big contributor to this. Satin stitch text will pull the threads apart that are printed and reveal the unprinted threads underneath it. So that's a different thing to handle with prints. And certainly that's a slightly different uh, aspect to it altogether. But it's something, especially when we're dealing with camouflage and camouflage hats particularly. Uh, and Frank says it's the weft. All right, so it may be the weft. I, I couldn't remember if it's the warp or the weft, what it, what it was for that. Um, but that's the thing. Also, Brian says, we used to call it fabric lashing when it comes up like that, break out your markers. Uh, this is one of the reasons that I tell folks that I want you to learn a little bit more about fabric structure. Some commercial embroiderers, especially you come from print, you come from a different, uh, or you come from design, you come from a different angle into embroidery. You may not realize how much physical interaction is happening with the fabric, how much the weave or the knit in, is involved in how the finished piece looks. And in this particular case with sublimated garments, uh, with chambray, but like I said, especially one of the ones that I had the most trouble with, I believe it's called Cryptech, the tech modern sublimated camouflage. That is the worst because a lot of it's very dark, especially when we're talking about the city camouflages that have black and gray. 
that black and gray contrast heavily with the white and you'll find people who are trying to fix it with their bobbin thread. They're trying to fix it with, uh, you know, they're trying to fix it with using different thread colors on top. Unless you're going to go white thread on top and just embrace the fact that the edges look rough, you're not going to get that. Uh, so that's one of those things. It's just something that you have to deal with. And what I would say is in this era of patches being so popular, once again, back in the day when I first wrote this article, the first version of the article, even the second version of the article, direct embroidery was seen as classy and patches were seen as less quality. And that is not the case now at all. I mean, I have always loved patches. And for me, old school patches, seed corn hats, mechanics hats, and ephemera. For me, that stuff was cool anyway. I liked it anyway as a stylistic cue. But when we're talking about it now, now it's actually seen as boutique high-end retail to apply a decoration. Now that we have that in our arsenal, I see no reason not to go with patch hats with patches on that sublimated material because the stitching on a patch, as long as you're not doing a full satin edge on it, is never going to reveal all of that background. Uh, and so I think that's something that's that's interesting to think about. Um, with that, guys, I want to go into, I said we would do a little bit about color, and I've shown you all these different options. One of the other things I want to show you briefly, we talked about this too. Uh, we're going to talk about color and context, and here's one of the things that people do. Now, this is uh, from a page from Brilliance Enthusiast. In the Enthusiast module, we have the ability to do these really cool, like high color, or these high resolution renderings now that are on a transparent PDF. So it makes it, or a transparent PNG, it makes it really super easy to drop them in like this, right? So we can drop them in, and this is a very simple version on a flat garment. You saw me earlier, I actually warped this one uh, custom. This piece I did custom, where I took a, uh, a transparent PNG and I warped it in Photoshop onto this garment. I didn't use a tool to do that, I did that manually. And uh, for this big company, this big customer, it made a lot of sense to do that, especially because we were having issues trying to select colors. But when we're talking about something like this, there's one issue I want to bring up with you guys and make sure that I kind of hammer this through before we finish. And that is that I want you to use disclaimers. And when we're talking about color matching, especially do the disclaimer. And what I mean by this is color lives in a context, especially with thread. We know we talk about thread and the dimension of thread all the time artistically, but that dimension and the shine, the sheen of standard polyester rayon embroidery thread means that we have a shadow tone, we have a highlight tone, and we have kind of a specular shiny highlight on it. And those three kind of tones that are in the thread are kind of different colors. And we also have a stitch angle. We specifically use stitch angle. Remember last week in the pixel embroidery that we discussed, we use stitch angle specifically to give you different color tones and shine and facets. Well, that means that when we're talking about matching colors, if something has you know vertical threads versus horizontal threads, it's gonna change what the color looks like. And the truth of the matter is this also changes depending on what background the color is on, makes it look different to your eye, and the light that you're in. So I want you guys to, to do the disclaimer. What I mean by this is whenever you're showing somebody a preview like this, when you're showing them, admittedly, awesome preview, and actually in this software, we don't have that super high shadow and shine, so we're not seeing quite the same shifting of the hue of the thread that you might see in some software. But I still think it's worthwhile. I did this with every customer I sent a mock-up like this. I said, colors on screen or printed out are not 100% accurate to thread at any time. If you want a completely accurate thread match, we will need to match, match in person or send samples at your cost. Now, we can talk about why you do that, how you do that, how you handle that, how you handle charging for that. But the thing is, we have to, when we're doing digital previews, we must let customers know that you're not going to have a 100% color match. Every email you send, you should just have this as something you can put, uh, paste in as boilerplate that you could handle in some other fashion that is part of your usual mock-up. Because invariably, someone's going to come back to you and say, the yellow in that daffodil is just not the yellow that I thought it was going to be. They need to understand that unless they've given you a thread color, they've seen it in person, that they have a thread card in hand with your threads wrapped on it, whether it's from the manufacturer or something that you've provided them. Uh, if they aren't holding a sample, if they haven't come into your shop and uh, uh, managed to sit there with the cones with you and hack out which colors are their colors, or we're working on Pantone. Now, here's the thing. Even when we're matching Pantone, because we have that shadow, shine, and highlight, and stitch angle, you may find that your customer doesn't agree with you on your match, or that they don't agree with what the brand name who makes the thread matches that Pantone color too. So no matter what, I'd say always do the disclaimer and say if, it's, if it is very, very important for you to have an exact color match, 
or like when we're working with prints, where we're matching to a print that they need to do that in person. And I always say like in the thread, like in the flesh, you need to actually see this with your eye under, at least under some decently controlled light. If you, uh, people who do crafts and art know they sell lights that are specifically made so that you can match colors underneath them and that it is uniform light. Well, why is that? Because different lighting situations, different monitors, different color profiles on monitors. If you have two monitors and you've moved a, a window back and forth between the two of them, let's say they're two different ages, two different styles, or two different brands, you have already seen this. The colors shift and change. And also, if someone's viewing that same monitor with sunlight streaming in a window or not, it's going to change the way that looks even on screen. So you do the disclaimer and always let people know that color changes with context. And here's the thing I want to show you. And this is actually from a really cool class. So I'm going to show you a little bit of stuff from, I take classes myself to learn more of this stuff. And one of my favorite people who does classes on vector art and design is a guy named Von Glitchka. And he does them often on lynda.com or now LinkedIn Learning. Uh, I'm lucky enough that my uh, local library system out here in Albuquerque, New Mexico gives us free access to LinkedIn Learning or lynda.com. But this is the class that I'm actually going to show you a couple of things from. It's called Do Drawing Ver Vector Graphics, Color and Detail. And I'll go ahead and actually s put a link to this in the comments in case you want to take a look at this stuff. But we'll go ahead and show you this. It is a paid class, so it's something that if you don't have access, like I said, go to your local library or your college library or whatever. See if they have uh, either lynda.com or LinkedIn Learning. Ask somebody if they have it. Like I said, you're in Albuquerque with me. Rio Grande Valley Library System has this as something you can sign up for for free. Uh, and if not, you know, it's something you may, be, it might be worthwhile to pay for or take up, take them up on a free month and check out this class. Uh, he also is somebody from whom I learned how to draw really clean Bezier curves. So if you have trouble drawing Bezier curves or using that tool instead of traditional embroidery tools, uh, Von Glitchka is a really cool guy to look at. And like I said, I like to share the resources I use and I've taken several of his courses online. But here are a couple of things I wanna show you. And this is something that I love of his and I, I think it is absolutely gonna knock your socks off. Um, this is something that I think is super, super useful. Color affects other color. And these are the examples that he puts together and I think they are just spectacular. And so I wanna show these to you. Um, just lovely. First one here, ghost in the castle. That ghost is the same gray the entire way across. <laughs> the background castle. Now we were talking black and white. We are not talking, I mean, not black and white, you know, two bits here where we are talking not, not on and off. We're talking about a grayscale. In grayscale, you can already see, look at how much lighter that that ghost looks like on the right in the context of the black Background. Well, that absolutely goes for how your shirt is going to look. If you have a black shirt versus a white shirt with the same silver thread color on it, you can imagine it's going to look darker on the white shirt than it looks on the black shirt, and you may have a customer have issues with it. Now, certainly most of them are going to be okay with this kind of stuff, but it does just go to show you, and especially with colors, it changes a lot. Now, let's go ahead and go down a couple more of these because I think it really is interesting. And especially if you talk about like warm and cool colors and how that affects things and complementary colors, I'm going to show you guys briefly a little uh, color theory link and I'll send you that if you guys want to learn more about color theory. Like I said, we're not going to dip deep into that. Here's another one, moon in the sky. How much darker does that yellow look? How much richer does that yellow look on the left-hand side than the right-hand side? Except for it is the same yellow all the way across. It's an optical illusion that makes it look like it changes. So that's something that's worth looking at, guys. It's absolutely the way to handle that. Uh, you need to realize that color changes in context. Same thing here. Same red in the face on that tiki, on the blue, on a cool color that is lighter than it. Look how dark and how rich that red looks. On the right-hand side, it almost looks orange when it's faced with a darker red. It almost looks orange and looks a little bit uh, warmer. On the left-hand side, we're actually getting a cooler look to it in general, but we're getting that warmer, orangey, that almost lighter look, that almost orangey. Like I said, it almost has, looks like it has some yellow in it, but it doesn't. It's our eye that's making that change. Same color in that tiki head on both sides right? Same thing here. Look at that yellow and blue. How much different does that gray color look? How does that look? The bluish gray looks more bluish gray on the one side, on the left-hand side, on the right hand looks almost yellowish gray or greenish a little bit. These things are absolutely predicated on the background. So remember, when we're dealing with color, color only lives in context and under a light source. And the color of our light source and the context that we're working with can change it. Also, when you're talking about complements, 
versus things that are analogous or other kind of colors. When we're talking about uh, complementary colors, colors that are on the opposites of the color wheel, we'll show you briefly like this red and green on the right hand side. Look how alive that looks. Now, admittedly, it's almost annoying. It is hard to deal with. The eye almost kind of fights that red and green together. It is, you know, Christmas colors. It can be rough, but look at how it lo how much different it looks like on the yellow than it does on the green, despite the fact that that is the same color chip in the center. So same thing here, and this is the last example. Look at this, the snake in the garage with the snake in the jar, how much different those greens look and the, the value looks so much different based on the background that's in there. It's something that Vaughn puts through. So I've got a couple other pieces from Vaughn that I'm just gonna flash up on screen really quickly. Um, color wheel, like I said, red and green are opposite on that color wheel. So you can see that those are the things that set off very sharply. If you want a lot of contrast, it's a wonderful way to go. But then you can have different groupings where, like, like you said, something is more you know, on the same side and that warm side, the red and the yellow is not going to have that same kind of incredible offset and kind of agitation that you get from the red and the green. So something else to look at there. And when I say warm and cool, I'm just going to show you this real quickly. Over here are the cool hues. They have more blue in them on that left-hand side. Over here are the warm hues. They're more, you know, red, orangey, warmer colors. So when you hear warm and cool, that's what we're talking about. Uh, and over here is another thing that's really cool from that same uh, class, and that is talking about emotional connections, psychological connections with color. Not everybody really ascribes to this, but when you're trying to select color, you may want to look at this and kind of look at this sort of attitude and think about the fact that colors are selected this way, especially think about logo types and colors for brands. Frequently, they're thinking about what kind of reaction they're getting out of their clients. They're thinking about what that's going to be. So this is all stuff that was in that class. Um, I recommend going and doing your free month and then, hey, do the free month and cut it off. It's fine. Uh, do a couple of classes from Vaughn and then do something else later. But it's something that if look into your local library and see if you have lynda.com or LinkedIn Learning as something that they offer. I did in my library system and I know uh, some of my friends who have either a community college or college courses that they've worked on sometimes will have access to this as well. Take a look and see if it's there. Um, if not, there's a lot of free stuff that he's put out there. So Von Glitchka, if you look him up, a uh, very interesting guy and he's shown some interesting stuff out there. And if not, there are tons of classes on color theory. And the other thing I wanted to go ahead and uh, give you guys a couple little pieces. This is one from uh, the Modern Met Museum. And this is a a piece where it just kind of shows you some things about color theory. We can talk about these different groupings of colors. Uh, it talks about, also this is another thing that's interesting, hue, shade, tint, and tone. The hue is the actual color that we're talking about. Shade is when we add black to it and it gets darker. Tint is when you add white to it. Tone is when we add gray to it. And these are some terms that you may have seen and you might not have known. There's that warm and cool section again. And we can talk about color schemes and harmony. And like I said, complementary, opposite sides of the color wheel. And then we have things like this analogous when they're next to each other in the color wheel. And these are things that we can use to kind of help us choose color schemes, especially when we're making our own alternate color schemes to deal with these prints and these backgrounds. So this is another thing that I'm gonna go ahead and drop in the comments for you guys, just a little bit about color theory. And this is just a free article from my modern Met. I have it on a readability thing. So it takes all the ads and stuff out for you guys to see. There'll be some ads in there, um, but you can see some of these cool kind of uh, the tetradic split complementary. It's ways to select colors on the color wheel uh, that will help you kind of just get a, an interesting palette together. And we can talk about things like they're achromatic, there's a grayscale, monochromatic, where we're using tint, tone, and shade on one color to make something. Uh, especially if you think about this like a breast cancer month, boy, there we are right there. How many people do those logos? And in fact, I've done tons of uh, military and Air Force stuff. Usually it's in a grayscale, of course, but if you look at a subdued version of a patch, have you ever heard of the term subdued? Frequently it's a monochromatic either. I've done it in uh, in uh like olive greens and drabs or in blacks, uh, grays and silvers and done a monochromatic rendering of a logo. So these are all interesting things to show you that I just thought would be interesting. The other thing I wanted to say is why is it interesting to learn color? Why do I kind of show you guys color theory? Um, learning about colors is also how we do things like blending. We guys talked, we talked about blending and gradients before. If you look at this, it looks like a really wide color gamut, but if you looked at this image in grayscale, you would notice that I've got a pretty, consistent value across these. They don't contrast really heavily. The hue changes, not the kind of intensity or the lightness is not very different. And that's how you get all of these colors to blend into a really nice uh, gradient like that. And I mean, we talk about technique and maybe we'll do another article about this or another uh, piece about this article at some point, but you can see that blending. Why does that blending work so well? Uh, learning a little bit about the way colors are put together is how that works. 
All right. So I know we covered a lot. Oh, gosh, guys. <laughs> Pardon me real quick. You shouldn't see that. That is uh, what happens when all of your icons from a folder get in one place. Uh, <laughs> I have to clean that up. That is my backup folder you just saw a bunch of stuff out of. It was in my desktop. But here, let's go ahead and finish this up with the last little bit of some of the stuff we have worked on today. We talked about embroidering on prints, right? And we talked a little bit about color, context, and correction, how to handle color and how to deal with context. Well, the first thing to say is we have these options. We can fight with that print or we can go with the flow. Uh, we can either fight with the print, which is offsetting things, doing outlines, backgrounds, patches, anything to knock the print out of the way. Or we can go with the flow. We can use colors from the print. We can accessorize. We can use different positions. Or we can somehow include the print or an, uh, an element from the print, a shape from the print, a color from the print in our rendition to make it work. So in short, what I would say is it's worth doing the thing we should always do. Talk to the customer about what's important to them. Describe to them the problems you see happening with the print, especially when we have a super contrasty piece like that. And then give them the option and say, do we want to fight this print? Do we want to knock it out of the way? Do we want to do something that's going to offset the logo? Or do we want to make it part of the logo? Do we want to coordinate with it? Do we want to accessorize, do a different variant version of the logo that hypes up the fact, pumps up the fact that it is a holistic piece that is made with this print in mind. And these are the options that we're looking for. The other things I really want to make sure I bring back into focus for you guys, do the disclaimer. Whenever we're doing things like prints like this, where we're dealing with something that color starts to become an issue, when people are concerned about how things are going to look, um, absolutely make sure you've done the disclaimer, which me means let them know that the colors you show them, especially in digital previews, are not going to be 100%. Even if you take a photo and then send them the photo, these are not going to be 100%. That color and context and lighting all come together to make things look different depending on what people, either the viewing context or the context under which you took the picture. The other thing to do is if they have a corporate brand guide, like the one I showed you previously for the university, check for compliance. Make sure that you're working with the brand guide and offer other options if it turns out that you cannot comply fully with the brand guide and do what they want to do. Let them know. Let them know why. And then the last thing is, guys, I would suggest to you to learn a little bit of color theory. Uh, it doesn't mean that you want to go deep into color theory. I think knowing what a color wheel is, knowing a little bit more about how the colors fall on it is worthwhile. And knowing how colors are put together may help you to select colors or make a color palette that makes more sense for your print and for your logo. Uh, the other thing I'm going to tell you guys is clean up your desktop and don't let people see that you have a gigantic page full of uh, icons. <laughs> I might cut that out of the uh, recorded version, folks. But with that, uh, last thing I'm going to leave you with one more time is if you want to check out that Reggie's voting, go out there and vote for Lisa, vote for me, vote for Christine, vote for all the cool people who are on there. There's a lot of fun stuff there that people uh, really have worked hard on. And I want to make sure that I thank you guys once again, the reciprocators and Mike, who's reciprocator number one. Uh, thank you very much for engaging with me, for staying on and for letting me know what you need out of the show too. We're going to keep on going with this, going to come back again next Friday. So if you have something you want to see, something you need, Leave a note in the comments. Catch me on social media. Go to ericcampbell.com. Find me somewhere. And as you know, I will be back here in the Brilliant Studios next week talking about something that's important to you. So all you have to do is engage with me and reciprocate. Let me know what you need, and I will absolutely include it in the running for what we're going to run up to in the next coming weeks. We've got more and more to do. And with uh, 41 under my belt, I am ready to do more. So with that, guys, I cannot wait to see you again next Friday and have a fantastic weekend. Keep on stitching.